Hello, everybody. Welcome to this program. Um, this year marks the end of the European funded project called EBRA. EBRA stands for the European Brain Research Area. And during this project, uh, research clusters were formed, um, bringing together researchers from different areas in order to work on specific topics. And we're very happy uh, today to start a first series uh, of interviews with representatives from these clusters to discuss with them what they've learned, what the achievements have been, and what the next steps are uh, regarding the activities that they've been carrying out uh, throughout the EBRA project. My name is Franz Nivelle, and I'm the Chief Communications and Content Officer of eBrains, a research infrastructure dedicated to brain research. And I'm very pleased to be your host today. And with us, uh, we've got the pleasure to welcome uh, the coordinator of the PRIMOS cluster, uh, Ms. Uh, Sabine Holter from the Helmholtz uh, Centrum in Munich. Good afternoon, Sabina. And uh, Professor Martin Kass from the University of Groningen, uh, who's a member of the cluster, um, and uh, who will tell us more about the activities that have been conducted. Good afternoon, Martin, and thanks for joining us. Now, before we get started, let me just uh, tell you a few more words about the PRIMOS uh, cluster. PRIMOS stands from, uh, for uh, preclinical models. And actually, the topic of the cluster was um, to focus on the translational value of animal models um, and um, on preclinical research and how this can inform uh, clinical applications. Now, all this sounds very um, interesting. And uh, just to get us started, uh, Sabina, um, these are, uh, you know, these sentences of translational value of animal models and preclinical research. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what it really means? Good afternoon, Franz. Great to be with you. Um, yes, of course. So the, the purpose of PREMOS was, was to bring together experts across academia and industry to think about how the process can be improved through which humans benefit from insights gained in basic brain research. And these insights are often gained by studying how the brains of animals work. And the process of transferring these insights to the benefit of humans is what I mean by translation. And, and in this sense, the animals used have a translational value and they are called animal models because they model the human condition or a human disease. And that means they stand in for the human for scientific purposes, which is a longstanding practice in brain research. And our aim in the PREMOS cluster was to commonly define the main challenges in the use of model organisms as predictive tools for the development of prevention and therapy of brain diseases, and to develop together ideas for new solutions. Well, thank you very much. And I understand that the cluster was very much an interdisciplinary approach uh, focused. And uh, um, can can you tell us about a little bit a little bit more? Sorry about the the the, the various contributors to this uh, to this uh, network. So the the partners of the Premos cluster were three consortia: Infrafrontier, Prism, and Equipped. InfraFrontier is a research infrastructure that brought in mouse genetics experts who have the expertise and the possibilities to generate and also to comprehensively characterize mouse models exactly to the needs which clinicians have defined as the important aspects of a disorder that has to be modeled. PRISM brings in neuroscientists and clinicians and experience with reverse or back translation, which means finding the quantifiable biological markers of clearly characterized patients that need to be modeled in animals and to effectively transfer these markers to the appropriate use in preclinical studies in animals. And I'm sure Martin can expand on this because he is the, the coordinator of PRISM. 
And the third consortium was equipped, and that is a quality control consortium, which is specialized on reprodu reproducibility and uh, equip developed training tools to ensure that preclinical studies and model systems are designed and performed in the best possible way. And all of these aspects are necessary to enhance the translation and value of animal models in general and to rethink under which conditions model systems can effectively lead to relevant clinical results. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Martine, then, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about PRISM? Uh, because you're the project coordinator and it's so important to have all those uh, different players, you know, as part of the, of the cluster. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting us and it's a great pleasure being here. Uh, PRISM was very pleased to contribute to the PRIMUS cluster uh, because we were, I think, one of the first consortia who tried to implement the idea of back translation. So we could really uh, explain our experience where we tried to identify quantitative biological parameters that could help us to classify uh, patients better, uh, but also to make the translational bridge to animals more feasible. Um, since most of the current uh, uh, phenotype description in humans are, are, are for example, for, for social functioning are based on questionnaires, you can imagine that it's much more difficult to apply that to animals. Mm -hmm. So rather you would like to have more quantitative measures of social functioning that you can then back translate to animals more easily. And that was, I think, what we were able to bring to the Primus cluster. Okay, so, so if you had to, you know, in very simple terms, you know, give a definition of, of the process of back translation. How could you summarize this? Is to make the measures for human and animal studies more comparable uh, and use, in fact, the quantitative aspect and the quantitative biology as kind of the common goal. Okay, very, very clear. Thank you very much. Yes, because um, um, it's not necessarily obvious uh, to draw conclusions from, you know, animal models and preclinical research and, and translate that into humans. So what are the current obstacles uh, that, that, that we find in, in, uh, in brain research today uh, in, in, in that domain? And maybe Sabina, you want, you want to tell us a little bit more about this? Um, well, I think the main obstacles are that um, most neuropsychiatric disorders are complex and their disease etiologies are not perfectly clear. And um, that, that most um, or, or many models are not necessarily very precisely um, described um, and that also very often not common terminologies, nomenclatures are being used in the in the description of, of models. Okay, yeah. And is, is this uh, what, what the cluster meant to uh, make clearer? And uh, what, what are the, the main findings actually of the work that was carried out in, in the PRIMOS cluster? Um, well, uh, we had pre many discussions um, between cluster members and also wider networks that the different cluster members like Martin or equip partners brought in. And, and we had a consensus that um, we need to work more closely together with preclinical pre and clinical scientists. And we also need to involve patients more in preclinical discussions to, to improve this transfer that, that Martin described as patients and clinicians do not always concur on what is a priority focus. And um, one idea, I think Martin voiced that once, uh, is that it should be mandatory that human studies provide quantitative and biological data to optimize this transfer. And in addition, we need to better understand the genetic and also the environmental contributions to brain diseases um, and to better understand the early life period including adolescents, both from a biological, um, neurodevelopmental point of view um, and from a clinical perspective, as this widens the, the scope for preventive measures against brain health problems in, in adulthood. And one idea that was developed that um, to make use of already existing resources and to prevent unnecessary duplication and, for example, also unnecessary duplication of use of animals, 
would be to reinforce access to already existing animal models and their detailed information, including negative results, um, as is, for example, available for IMPC models through national, European, and, and global repositories. And, and I think the last finding there on which there was a consensus was that, um, well, the biological mechanisms and functions studied in a model must be similar to humans to, to make this, this transfer relevant. And um, to validate a model cross species comparisons must be carried out more widely, including brain function, symptom, target, and, and drug response similarity, as these are important aspects for clinicians to consider a model clinically relevant. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yes, very, very interesting. Um, and, and turning to you, Martin, um, um, what, um, what do you think is um, the main, uh, what are the main obstacles today, uh, you know, uh, preventing uh, preclinicians from, uh, you know, working very closely with clinicians? Where, where, where do you think this comes from and um, what can be done uh, in order to, uh, to bring them to work together, you know, um, uh, more closely. Yeah, what I notice is at some point we need to start speaking the same language. I mean, yes. it's, uh, I think that's a very much an important point. And we have to appreciate that speaking the same language may take time. Um, mm -hmm. but we should actually be able to invest time in getting to know each other and try to better understand what are the issues. Uh, from a clinical perspective and from a preclinical perspective. Yes. So I was very lucky to, to coordinate the PRISM project. And in fact, the first months of the project, we sat together with people from industry, from academia, clinicians, preclinical researchers to determine now how to implement clinical and preclinical paradigms mm -hmm. for the domains of interest that PRISM is focusing on and to see whether we can reach consensus. Um, and, and, um, and I think that was a very important exercise um, where we also involved regulators and patient organizations and really start to discuss if you want to monitor social functioning in, in animals and in humans from, an, from a deep disease perspective, how will you do that in a translational and a transdiagnostic manner? And I think just by bringing the people at the table together and have open discussions, I think is a very nice way forward. Excellent. This is this is a uh, this is very much like a, a very great insight, you know, in into uh, future collaborations and uh, the necessity to bring various disciplines together instead of you know having those silos, um, the preventing um, um, closeness and and sharing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. In the end, it's, it's of course the funding that makes it happen. So because you, know, you need a project in order to be able to sit together and define the way forward together. And that's a matter of investment. Yes. And that also shows the value of, uh, you know, of such projects is that, uh, you know, this, this really gives an opportunity for um, cross uh, discipline work and, uh, and and making things advance and understanding, uh, you know, uh, progress uh, significantly. Yeah. So, um, yes. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm sure this is not a subliminal message, but uh, funding is definitely very important in order to bring the communities together. I mean, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, um, regarding the findings, uh, Sabina, um, are they going to be published, or I mean, how are you going to share the findings uh, of the of the cluster research um, project uh, with, with the community? Is there anything planned? Uh, well, yeah, there will be um, um, an editorial that will be published on open access government in, in October, in which basically the, the main findings that I, um, you know, in short uh, told you about will be um, published and expanded a bit on. Um, and there will be a report to the uh, European Brain Council and um, we will also talk about the findings in the public final EBRA conference on October 11th. 
Okay, great. Okay, so uh, very important uh, so that the community will have access to, you know, um, the achievements that um, that the network um, um, got to. Um, now, um, we've been talking about uh, PRISM and, uh, um, but Infra Frontier, the research infrastructure was also very much involved in the cluster work. Um, Sabina, can you, can you tell us a little bit about you know, the work that, or the value that was uh, brought, um, you know, uh, through this, this research infrastructure and research infrastructures in, in general, according to you? Sure. InfraFrontier is the European resource for studying the functional basis of human diseases. It's not um, limited to, to brain diseases, um, but it includes brain diseases and it provides genetic animal models for any human disease. Okay. Um, in including the comprehensive characterization of these animals, um, covering all organ systems. So InfraFrontier has global outreach because the InfraFrontier members are also members of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, IMPC. And InfraFrontier and IMPC have already estab established a lot of quality measures on mouse model production, as well as on the characterization. So InfraFrontier brings the mouse genetics community into the discussion with all the knowledge and resources of this community to model human diseases in rodents. And this community has a long-standing interaction with the human genetics community and experience with cross-species comparisons, both on the genetic and on the symptomatic level, because the question does our animal model adequately model the human disease has been vital for this community already for two decades. And usually wow. animal models do not model human diseases completely, but very often they model specific aspects of the disease. And it is important to describe specifically what the model is good for and what not. Yes, no, absolutely. Okay, no. Now, with the complexity of, um, you know, brain research, um, how would you rate the importance of animal models? Uh, is, is it even more important to, to have access to animal models and, and systems in brain research compared to even other disease areas? I'm not sure about that. Uh, you're asking me, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. But in, in, in my point of view, we need to change our view of the brain. The brain does not exist outside of the body. It is an integral part of our body and it controls and interacts both with our internal and with our external environment. So that means it reacts to signals from the periphery coming, for example, from our intestines, as well as to signals that we perceive from our external environment through our senses. And in animal models, you can study these brain body interactions and the effects of treatments on all tissues in the body in a way that would not be possible in humans because these investigations are invasive or even terminal. And we need these kinds of investigations to understand how diseases develop to be able to prevent them and to develop therapies against them. So nowadays, many brain research questions can be studied using alternative methods that address the micro level of the brain, meaning cells and synapses, Cellular systems or organoids cannot model complex behaviors or the complex physiology of a living organism, um, as is, for example, the case when treatments have long term effects that involve interactions of the periphery with the brain, as is, for example, the case in, in some drugs that have both a central and a peripheral mechanism of action. So, on the macro level, in vivo studies and animal models are still necessary to develop medical treatments. And I believe that is not only true for brain research. Okay, thank you very much. Martin, do you want to add to, add to that about the importance of, uh, you know, animal models um, and, and uh, the necessity, um, you know, in, in, in research? Well, first of all, of course, considering brain disorders, there is a very high unmet need. For, for treatment and uh, it's, it's enormous, uh, the, the amount of people being affected. So we really need solutions and it needs to be an integrated solution. Um, 
animal models will be very critical if we want to understand the neurobiology of behavior and cognitive processes uh, with the interaction of the environment. And they can provide us with the only tool to actually test for causality of human findings. So human findings can provide us with some nice ideas and hypotheses, but we actually need to test for causality and we need to intervene. And that's only feasible and possible at the moment using these animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, the, definitely. Um, well, thank you for this. I mean, this is a very, very interesting. Um, now, maybe switching to um, again to the approach and you know the research community working working together. Besides uh, funding opportunities, um, what would you see as uh, other uh, incentives? And I'm not necessarily talking about financial incentives uh, to bring the research community closer and working more closely together. I mean. Are, are there are there learnings uh, that you had from your discussions with the uh, with the, with the various stakeholders in your in your cluster? And, yeah, and maybe I, think the, I, think, team, yes. I think the incentive is very obvious. I mean, as I said before, there is a huge unmet, uh, high unmet need. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a very very uh, strong obligation to help the patients getting better. So I think that, that, that should stand uh, up front. And then, of course, we need to understand the complexity of the brain with this interaction in, in the environment. So that it requires a lot of expertise and insight. And we have to accept that we need an integrated experimental approach to, to solve these, these yeah, complex questions. So we have to work together and we have to understand each other's language and, 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 and yeah, have more interdisciplinary approaches. I think that's the only way forward. Yes. Sabina, anything to add to this? No, I think Martin just summarized it perfectly. Okay, thank you. Now, the, you know, the, the EBRA project is coming to an end. So the work of your cluster is, is as part of the project is coming to an end as well. But what are, are you planning uh, future activities or how can we make sure that, you know, everything that has been uh, leveraged uh, through the project can, can continue in one way or another. Any any future activities planned and uh, other other areas or directions? Well, first of all, I would like to say that the Premos cluster was really a great facilitator to start more interactions, both among us cluster members and beyond. For example, with the other EBRA clusters, um, the Global Preclinical Data Forum, and with other research infrastructures like Eatris, Equin, eBrains, and, and, and others. And, and I firmly believe that these um, closer interactions will, will pay off in, in, you know, relatively soon. So, but the most um, direct continuation of the Premos work uh, will happen within the ECNP and in the Global Preclinical Data Forum network where we will work on, on ways to realize the ideas that have been developed by the cluster. And, and this was, will already start during meetings in October this year, for example, mm -hmm. um, at the ECAP Congress in Vienna. Okay, well, um, um, and, and uh, Martin, can you tell us a little bit more about ECNP and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, what, what, um, what, what the goal and ambition of that network is? Yeah, so ECMP, I think, is the largest uh, neuroscience apply uh, organization in, in Europe, uh, having a yearly congress where about five to six thousand people attend annually, with really the focus on bringing, bringing together uh, preclinical and clinical research with the aim to facilitate uh, treatment for, for brain disorders and to promote brain health. Um, and indeed, the, the, the pre uh, ECMP has a, about 20 different networks focusing on different areas, ranging from uh, digital health to preclinical data quality um, uh, to, to experimental medicine. And the idea is, is that within these networks, uh, groups like Primos or participants from Primos come together and discuss uh, the front being the front runner in that field and hopefully actually to interact 
with the other networks where we actually then try to establish these preclinical clinical interactions and to actually yeah foster foster these type of interactions Oh, that's 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 really good news then. So all this work, uh, you know, will continue and uh, will be uh, taken forward. So um, this is very um, motivating to know that, uh, you know, the the great effort that was put into the cluster um, does not stop uh, with the cluster ending, but will continue um, and, and will be pursued um, through other networks and, um, and uh, associations. So um, thank you very much for, for this. I think um, uh, this is a very good message to, to end uh, this conversation uh, on. You know, the work will continue. It has opened uh, new doors and, uh, and, uh, and, and it has a, a great uh, continuation path ahead of uh, ahead of itself so that's that's very nice so thank you very much to both of you for this very insightful interview uh and um and uh i i wish you uh, the very best in in your future research and endeavors um and i would like to um uh, tell our audience that um uh, other clusters will be featured in uh, future editions of, uh, of such interviews. And uh, we are looking forward to um, talking to uh, many more uh, other scientists in the future. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you soon.